Hello and welcome to Piano Lessons in Boulder. I'm Sarah Hager. Last time I gave a brief introduction to and played for you Chopin's Nocturne in C minor, Opus Posthumous. Today we will do a detailed tutorial on how to study it and how to play it. So I, of course, played it from the Ultex, from the Henlevelag, and the first thing that jumped out at me is that there are no expression marks, no tempo indication. He doesn't even tell you whether to play Andante or Larghetto or anything. No phrase lines and no pedal marks. So it's clear to me that for Chopin this was still a rough draft and he was not ready to publish it and that if he was going to publish it, uh, he he would have added all those details, but he set it aside for a while, maybe intending to publish it later or maybe never. I will never know. But so, if it were Bach, this would have been the the actual text because Bach never wrote anything, no expression marks, no tempo indications, no phrase line. But Chopin wrote everything and wrote it in detail telling the performer in minutest detail how the music is to be played. So that is one thing to note. Now the second thing, because there is no tempo, what tempo should it be played at? So I play it roughly between 100 and 108 uh, to the quarter note. Of course, I played it in the previous video at 104. And once you set a tempo, then you must sustain that tempo. The left hand must never budge, regardless of the rise and fall of emotion in the right hand. You see, we talk of tempo rubato in Chopin. Of course, Chopin is to be played with tempo rubato, but the rubato is only in the right hand, not in the left hand. Liszt tried to explain this to his students by saying that when Chopin played his music, the left hand was like the trunk of an oak tree that never moved, whereas the right hand was like the branches and the leaves, the branches swayed in the breeze and the leaves rustled in every passing breeze, but the trunk remained unmoved. So um, this is very, very important. Without it, the music loses its dignity, loses its nobility. And Chopin, as I said in the previous video also, never wore his heart on his sleeve. While he bears his heart to us at the same time, he does it with aristocratic reserve. And so therein lies the challenge of playing Chopin. Uh, to play it with sentiment, with feeling, of course, so much feeling in Chopin, but without sentimentality. And one has to beware of crossing the line between sentiment and sentimentality. Huge difference uh, between the two. Now, um, when he, you know, modulates in, uh, into C minor, at measure 17. And then he repeats these two measures. So what I do is the first time I play in one tone. Second time. second half of the phrase differently and whereas I took did rubato in the right hand I did not do rubato in the left hand one never does rubato in the left hand and that was an illustration of that point and in measure four you have this little run and then in measure 12 he repeats the same run in the right hand but the left hand is no longer playing a straightforward C minor, but you see F sharp, an alien note, which also brings us to the fact that 
when the nocturne starts, in the right hand, in the second measure, there is an F sharp. So it's... Now you see, you know that F sharp doesn't belong to the key of C minor. It's the alien note. Alien note. That's what makes it so poignant. The F sharp tells you right away that this is not reposeful that there is sadness, but thinly veiled, concealed the sadness, and therefore all the more poignant. Now, this F sharp transits to the left hand in measure 12. You know, a very subtle change from the previous. that F sharp in the left hand you say, oh, what was that? That was interesting. Now, you don't only play with expression marks, but also with changes of color. When he modulates briefly for four measures into A flat major, there is a respite from pain. Uh, you know, you see a little bit of blue sky so this must be played with a different color, different touch. And then the pain returns. This is really awesome how he, without any warning, that the, the clouds come back and really dark this time. There are some passages of which, for which you'll have to do spot practice. Uh, 26, 27, for instance. This will need a lot of practice. And you can practice this passage going up, I mean coming down as written, but also going up like this. And practice as many times as you need to. Uh, you know, one of my students said, how many times should I play this? And I said, as many times as you need to till you've got it. And she said, you know, I hate that answer. I would have even preferred it if you'd said a hundred times. I said, yeah, I'm sorry, but that's why I didn't, because one person may need to practice it a hundred times, another may need to practice it just ten times. So, practice it till you get it. And the ending is utterly simple. It must be played without Rita Dando, and without any fuss. Just like that, one more time. Yeah, not sentimentality, not... No. That's it. That is the beauty of Chopin. The beauty in this ending lies in its simplicity. So once again, thank you so much for watching and until we see each other next time,